we're here with uh, Joe Azapati today, who uh, has a PhD from Avondale U University College in New South Wales, um, and has also completed a Master of Arts in Youth and Young Adult Ministry from St Andrews in Barron Springs, MI. Which one? Michigan. Does... Michigan. Thank you. Um, early on, Joe spent 10 years as a teacher, mostly in high schools, and has taught as young as kindergarten. He's pastored rural senior congregations, an urban young adult congregation, as well as experience as a school chaplain. Currently, Joe serves as an associate pastor at Springwood Adventist Church in Brisbane, Australia. His broad background with various age groups, as well as a passion for practical Christianity, lead Joe to research how discipleship, well-being, and intergenerational relations intersect. His mission is to equip Christian leaders as not only ministers, but as teachers and facilitators so that disciples, not merely members, are, re are reproduced. Uh, as of the publication of his book, Joe has, oh, sorry, jo Joe has been married to the love of his life, Jodine, for 17 years. They have three children. Um, and we celebrate Joe's recent PhD. Woohoo! Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll hand over to you, uh, Joe, as, as you take us through this session today. Thank you. No worries. I'm just going to share my screen with you so you won't have to look at the window behind me. There we go. Um, thank you very much for coming, everyone. Um, just a little bit to understand the, um, the background of my research. Uh, my dissertation was looking at the impact of discipleship on well-being in intergenerational congregations. So there was um, the three words that are lit up. I needed to measure each one of those, which uh, was a feat in itself. Uh, it, I had to come up with a 717-item questionnaire. There were 545 people who graciously filled out the questionnaire, or at least most of it, and that was from 11 different congregations. Uh, I also did interviews, so I interviewed 14 people from four of the congregations. I uh, got almost 500 interview minutes out of it, and there was an age range of... Uh, 16 to 18, 80 years old, which is great. I'm just trying, bear with me. I'm trying to find my mouse on the share screen. Um, okay. So the findings of the research, I'm just quickly going through what my findings were. There was three main findings. I'm going to be looking at, specifically intergenerationality in this, but the first finding was well-being is positively impacted by discipleship. So discipleship being those who not only believe in Jesus, but who actually earnestly try to follow his teachings. We're at, we actually have better health when we do that. Uh, well-being is also positively impacted by intergenerationality. So when we actually mix with people and have relationships with people of different ages, it is um, a huge benefit uh, for our health. And uh, finally, we have discipleship is positively impacted by intergenerationality. So that is basically saying that we are um, better Christians when we have generations on either side of us. So those are the three main findings. But what I'm going to be talking to you today is... Um, is so what, how did I assess being an intergenerational community? I was surprised to find out that uh, there was no way of measuring that. So most of the research was um, through uh, stories and interviews. And so um, I need to find a way of how do you measure um, quantitatively how intergenerational churches. So a question I have and I'm trying to be able to see the, the chat at the same time. When I share the screen, it makes it difficult. But a question for you to put in the chat is um, how do you, pardon me, that's better. How do you, uh, 
If you were to measure what makes a community intergenerational, how would you measure it? What are the factors that you would put on there? Um, so what are the sorts of things that you think if I was to measure it? Shared spaces, I've got numbers eight, 23 to 25. Those are good, good things. Um, before you can really measure anything though, you have to be able to define what you're measuring. Yes, everyone together was definitely part of that. So a family, yes, yes, that's, that has come up. Uh, the, the definition that I came up with, and we have talked about the definition of intergenerationality in, in different um, sessions already, but this is how I defined it. An intergenerational community is one that is composed of several uh, of representatives of several generations who engage in positive interactions with each other, resulting in interdependency and mutual benefits. So basically, um, so some of you have mentioned it, not just being together, but also engaging um, activities outside the regular gathering. Uh, yes, not just once a week for two hours. Um, Act, it's active. We all actually are, are gaining something from being together. And um, the factors that I came up with was five specific factors. And uh, first one is positive interaction. And with positive interaction, this had to do with seeing, well, who are different people talking to? Asking that big question. And um, also finding out what are you actually talking about? because uh, we can all talk about the weather with different people who are, have uh, different relationships with us, but are we going any deeper than just asking um, what, their, what their day was like and getting, a, oh, I'm doing fine. The other one was connectedness. Connectedness is, is really, that's what creates a community. Uh, it's a sense of belonging with each other. And so, I assess general connectedness and also intergenerational connectedness. I'm going to look at these in more detail in a little bit. Interdependency, which is um, having uh, reciprocity with each other. So where different groups benefit by being together. So you're stronger by being together. Um, accommodation. This is where you're willing to give up something that you value, be it tangible or intangible in order for others to gain a benefit. Uh, and this serves to, to enhance inclusiveness. And then finally, empowerment. This is a very touchy word. Um, it's uh, empowering other people is probably something very difficult that a lot of church leaders find. And what I have found in talking to different people from different cultures, all cultures seem to have strengths and weaknesses in, depending on, on which factor we're talking about. Um, so let's look at a closer look at the factors. First of all, positive interactions. I have a question for you uh, and be sure to put some answers in the chat box. Why do you think the word positive is important with positive interactions? Because I've, I had some people ask me, why don't you just put interactions? Why, why have you written positive interactions? Um, any thoughts as to why has anyone had any negative interactions? Yes. And they're all flowing through. Um, there's always interactions that take place in a church. Well, at least most of the time, but unfortunately with a lot of churches, um, the interactions are not always positive. Sometimes people think that they are being positive by letting them know what they think should be changed but um, that doesn't actually build people up. Some people have mentioned to build other people up. Uh, we need to show that it's a flourishing community. Um, we, it, in a negative environment, people are not going to want to be there. Um, we may have had, um, if anyone's had kids or been a child, you've, you've probably had glances from some certain people if noise was made. So we're looking at positive interactions. Uh, some things that the research, my research found is uh, people tend to interact the most 
with generational peers. That's not really a mind blowing thing, but it was interesting to see that when I asked the question, um, do you talk to kids? Do you talk to young adults? Uh, do you talk to middle-aged adults? Do you talk to seniors? Uh, the person who was filling out the survey, they tended to, to have the highest amount of um, conversations with people who were their own age. The people who interacted the least with um, certain generations, it was with generations that uh, they don't naturally mix with. So it wasn't too much of a surprise that uh, the seniors in my study, um, they had the lowest score with talking to kids because especially these days as our society is quite segregated when it comes to ages, um, they don't actually see kids too much. And if you don't hang out with people on a regular basis, you may not have a, a good idea as to how to talk to them. And so because of this, Internet intentionality is needed to connect with people that we don't naturally mix with. It's uh, one of the issues that we tend to see with churches is that um, before and after church, when there is social time that's taking place, people naturally draw to the people that they, they know. Um, they naturally connect with people who are of their own age um, I've had some people say, oh, my church is, is very intergenerational. I talk to young people or old people all the time. But when I ask the question, but are you related to those people? Sometimes they go quiet and they say, oh, yeah, actually the people who aren't my generation, um, they, they tend to be my, my nephews or they're my grandma. So we need, there needs to be a culture of intentionality when it comes to seeking out people who are different to us. Um, we, so I, I would say to my church members, uh, you have two or three hours together. You've got maybe an hour where we're all sitting down being quiet for those other, uh, that other hour or two. Can you just pick 10 minutes where you actually look for someone who is different to yourself, someone who is younger or older than you, um, who you're not related to maybe someone you don't know very well and have a chat to them. Uh, because it's only when we intentionally uh, go out of our way to talk to people that we are different from, that we are actually going to change this idea of, of talking to people who are um, not exactly like us. So there are, um, there's a few ways I've listed to how to develop a culture of intentional interaction. Um, and that's through um, times and spaces. And um, this is just three I've put down. There's probably many more that you could come up with, but um, you can develop intergenerational times and spaces when, um, whether you're doing like life groups or small groups or growth groups or cell groups, so many names for basically the same thing. We can, we can have um, small groups where we have a variety of ages in them. It does take more work, but it can be done. When we have socials, instead of planning a social um, for a particular age group, we can think about well, what can we create a social where people are doing something and um, several different generations would enjoy doing the activity. Uh, for example, if you're going to have a lawn bowling social, you're probably not going to get too many young people who are going to attend that. Um, whereas if you have something where it was board games, you, you have a bigger chance of getting a lot more people going to them. We need to intentionally um, think about the socials that we create so that we can create spaces um, and times where, where uh, we can be together. And yes, there, there, is, uh, there are younger people who do love things like lawn bulls. That was just an example I was giving. Uh, think about your particular congregation. And the third one is really important, and that's being a seeking culture. A seeking culture is where you create a culture in your church where people will seek, they will, they will be like um, heat-seeking missiles for people who are new, um, people who come from a different age group than themselves. Um, these are, this is something that um, I know that, I would expect that most pastors would dream that their church would become where, where they would 
uh, be able to get their congregation to, to intentionally find 10 minutes, maybe more, where they're not talking to their regular friends, but they actually go and they seek people that they don't know or seek people that they know, but um, who are different to themselves so that they can develop um, relationships. The next uh, factor that I've looked at is connectedness. Uh, here's a question. Uh, are there different levels of connection? I would, I would think most people would say yes. I would say that most people in your church feel a, a very basic connectedness to each other. Um, but just because they belong to the same church does not mean they have a deep connection to each other. Um, just because there's two people who happen to go to the same, who actually cheer for the same footy team or rugby team um, does not mean uh, that they are connected on a very deep level, even if you happen to sit beside someone. And so to create a sense of belonging, it takes place when people feel as though they are part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, earlier, it was mentioned that um, the word family, family is a very good example of this because family is something that you can be a part of that is bigger than yourself because family is not made of one person. Uh, and uh, I know in my own family, I've got three kids. They're each very different. Um, there's my wife as well. And, and the five of us, that we do not, we definitely do not all agree on things. Um, however, um, we have each other's back when push comes to shove. And I'm thinking especially of my two oldest kids. I've got a, a son who is 12 and a son who is seven. And uh, some days they get on well and other days we, we need to physically keep them apart. Um, the older son loves to, to tease the younger son and I believe it was last year, I felt very, um, very proud to find out that there was someone at school who was, um, who was teasing and uh, bullying my younger son. And I found out that my older son actually stepped in and defended him. Um, and for me, that is what family is. So even though we are not always going to be um, in agreement with each other, we do not, it doesn't mean that we can't be friends with each other. And in the, in the interviews in particular that I took with um, all the different people, the word family came up to describe the church that they were a part of, because each of the churches I looked at, they were intergenerational churches. Uh, and um, once again, being connected to a group of people that you feel you have identity with, with them. Uh, an intergenerational community requires connection between unrelated people of different generational backgrounds. I mentioned that before. Um, it's very easy for us to think that we are intergenerational when we, we talk to our family members at church, um, but that is just very natural. An intergenerational community we have individuals who not only talk to members of their family who are from different generations, but they will talk to people that they are not actually related to who are different mem who are uh, from different generations. So we need to create a sense of family um, and creating a sense of family uh, requires opportunities to get to know each other on a deeper level. If you never have the opportunity to really get to know someone, it's going to be very difficult to be connected to them. And there's different ways that we, we do this. One of the ways is actually a central pillar of, of the Christian church, and that's having opportunities for testimonies. Um, testimonies are wonderful for so many different reasons. It helps us all have a better understanding of um, where the journey that people have taken. It really gets rid of that sense of um, plastic that can take place in, in the church where we think everyone has everything together. Everyone takes pictures on, on Facebook and it makes it look like their life is perfect. When we have testimonies, we can, we can really get to know the struggles that people have gone through and how God has actually come through. 
Uh, testimonies are a really good way of, of being able to connect with different people because they will learn about that person in a deeper sense. Another thing you can do is have informal interviews. Um, you may have heard of speed dating. Uh, that's an example of an informal interview where you have people from different generations who actually, they ask each other questions and they ask each other, aside from questions about the weather, um, they actually get to know um, the other person. They find out a bit of a background about them. And then finally, we have mentoring and coaching. This mentoring and coaching takes time. Uh, it, it's, it's something that is a, is a very important aspect. Mentoring is actually the building block of discipleship. And um, mentoring is, is really something that um, someone who's looking for a mentor, they need to find someone that they can trust they need to be, we, you don't tend to have someone who is the mentor going up to someone else and saying, I can mentor you. That doesn't work so well as having someone younger look out for someone uh, that they want to be mentored by. But that, that can only take place if we're having the positive interactions that we talked about just before this. So that's connectedness. Let me see. Next one, we have interdependence. Um, Here's a question before I get into it. What does it mean to be interdependent? Because people often know what independence is, and we know what it means to be dependent on something, but what is interdependent? Okay, so we need each other, okay, depending on each other. So it's, 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 not, it's not a one direction thing. Okay, it's not being dependent is where one person needs another person, but it's not the actual, um, it's, it doesn't go the other direction. But interdependence uh, basically is, is something that we should strive to be as a church. It's, it's actually a level higher than being independent. Being interdependent means, yes, that we can do things by ourselves. However, um, life is so much more beautiful and so much more meaningful. And, and we have so many more benefits if we can actually work together. Uh, so it's, it's the understanding that everyone has something to offer the group. The young have something to offer their elders and as do the elders, the young. <clears throat> I'll give you an example of um, something, a request I was I was given just this week, um, our youth leader, I think she's about 20 years old, um, she's asked our elders um, to help her with having some testimonies um, on video so that she can share them with the different youth of the church. Uh, and um, our most senior elder, um, who I believe he's in his late 60s, he, could, he actually could be in his mid-70s, uh, but he's been very enthusiastic in saying, yes, I want to help. I'm happy to do a testimony. But he sent a message asking myself or, or the other associate pastor, can, you, um, can one of you help me to video myself on my phone? That's an example where you have um, the older person sees the value in having someone young help them with something that they're having a hard time with. And yet at the same time, he has something to offer the young people. And so it's a two-way relationship. There's in, interdependence. Um, you'll really know if your church has uh, interdependence happening if there is a noted difference in the mood of your church and in how your church functions if there is a certain age group who is missing. So if a youth rally is taking place, and all the youth in your church is gone, your church should notice that. Your church should um, struggle with some things or at least have to work a little bit harder to keep going. Why? Because they actually need the, they need the youth. We have an event in our uh, denomination in, in some of the regions where we have a, a, a camp that takes place called the Gray Nomads. And it basically, it's gray because they're older people, they've got gray hair, and they're nomads because they all have caravans. And so they, they go away for a camp and they have meetings and, and they're there for, for a good 10 days or so. 
when Grey Nomads happens, if the church is actually intergenerational, people um, should actually notice, not just uh, visually, but they should actually notice when it comes to how the church functions, what their conversations are like, that that group of people is gone. So interdependence is where you have unity in diversity. I mentioned before, we don't need to agree to be friends with each other. We can be diverse and we can be united together at the same time. So fostering interdependence uh, takes place through serving others while accepting help from other people. Sometimes uh, we find it easy to serve others, but we don't really want to ask for help. I've noticed as uh, someone who grew up in Canada, that's very much a, an, an Australian culture where someone's always worse off than me. And so I found that a lot of Australians have a hard time accepting help. But interdependence means where you're willing to accept help and you're also willing to give help to other people. Uh, some examples of activities that, um, that helps foster inter interdependence is um, doing a mission project. It, when, if the church is actually doing a mission project for other people, that's a great time where you have young and old come together and they, can, they each have things that they can contribute that's going to make the mission project go much better than if only one group was helping with it. Another example is skill partnerships. Um, and, and this is where uh, you have coaching takes place. Maybe your AV team is, is mentoring some uh, younger people, or maybe they're mentoring some older people on how to use the equipment. So this is interdependence where you, you have skill partnerships taking place. And sometimes when you're teaching someone younger, they will point out something that you didn't even realize yourself. This takes place also with sport where you have people coaching others. Another great one is um, international food fairs. That's great, um, not only because it tastes amazing, but when you have an international food fair, uh, it's, it's not just a generational thing, but you also have the cultural aspect coming in, in, in where we can appreciate the different flavors and the different tastes that come from different, different groups of people. And um, when we have things like that take place, it's interesting that we often see the different generations helping with creating the food as well. Have parties together. Um, I, I had a young adult church that I was pastoring a number of years ago in Canada. And um, the church was not, found, was not founded by myself. I was the second pastor to have it. But one of the struggles I had was because it was so young adult that there wasn't very many other people. And you can imagine the struggle that we had when we were trying to have potlucks when almost everyone's a university student. Um, everyone brings a bag of chips um, or a box of donuts. And that's pretty much all there is. There is no roasts. There is, there is no, none of the finer foods that are there. Uh, there's not many people who cook. And so um, it was actually difficult when you just had one generation present but when you have multiple generations present and they're all bringing in something we can really get an idea that we actually there's actually value when it comes to um, the other generations no one can stand alone everyone stands much straighter when other people are supporting them accommodation um, this one can be difficult with some churches but accommodation I'll ask a question, um, and I'm sorry I'm not getting a chance to, to um, read every answer that comes through, but just for the sake of time, hopefully we'll have more time at the end for that. But a question for you to, to um, answer in the chat, what hoops do people often have to jump through to have a sway in the church? What has to happen for someone to have influence in the church? turn 65 years old. Unfortunately, that, that is something that I've seen in some churches, to have a title, um, be there for a long time, be a good tither, uh, sometimes be a male, be a member, be qualified, have a Bachelor of Theology. That's often been the case for people who, who they say, I can't preach, I don't have a, a Bachelor in Theology degree. 
Um, there's so many hoops that we have. Um, and even in, even in the most diverse church, there are usually hoops in place. I've been to churches, and this is not just focused on one age group or another. I have been to churches where um, those, who are, those who are young um, were empowered and those who are old were not. I've been to a church where the old were, were told at the pulpit, and this was not my church. This was a church that, that um, I had been to, but the, they were told at the pulpit that the old people need to sit down and shut up which is awful. It's a terrible thing. And I've been to other churches where it's the opposite, where the, someone can't really have any say in the church until they turn 40 years old. Both are cases where um, accommodation is not put into place. And um, the, the thing is, is that Jesus always made room for those on the outside. He always did. Um, there, there's a series that my wife and I, we finished watching the first series and we just love it. Um, you may have heard of, um, the series, the chosen. I love it. If you, if you haven't seen it, look it up. It's basically uh, the story of Jesus instead of as a movie, as a series. And it's just fantastic. And, and one of the great things that you see in it is, is how Jesus is, he's, con- he's basically accept, accepting people who are on the outside and when um, Peter tells Jesus, um, when, he's, when he's saying to Jesus, why are you asking Matthew to come in? You, you, you don't understand what he's like. And, and Jesus says to Peter, uh, well, I picked you. And you said that, was, that you shouldn't be picked. And Peter said, well, that's different. And Jesus says to him, well, get used to different. Jesus always made room for those on the outside. And... Um, One example I can remember from when I was a teacher um, was my first teaching position. I I took a post um, in Canada. It was 4,000 kilometers from where I was living. Um, I went there. I was told there was lots of youth. There was actually only two youth. Um, And the reason why there was only two youth is because the youth were chased out of the church. Um, they were the the older folks didn't like the fact that they wore jeans and they didn't like the kind of music they listened to, and uh, they told them we'd rather you don't show up if you're going to dress like that and make sure you listen to the right kind of music. And for those of you who are Gen X like myself, um, Gen X was a very passive aggressive generation. We didn't always. Uh, tell other people what we were thinking. We used, we used our actions to leave the church and a lot of them just left. Um, So all too often the generational differences are barriers Um, and the generational differences, every generation has good and bad qualities. Each generation has things that they could do a lot better in, but every generation has good things about themselves And we need to understand that generational differences, um, we need to change some of the barriers into into things that can really improve our climate. Um, There are aspects about about millennials and about baby boomers and and about traditionalists and the Gen Zs. Each one of them has something to bring to the church. And the reason they're able to bring something unique to the church is because they are different to other generations. Uh, so seek ways to include those who are different. Uh, I've got a bunch of examples on here. Find ways to give access to those with disabilities. That's one. Create opportunities for different art forms in the service, as well as different ways to communicate. I I know with many of the churches I've been to, we really loved our music Um, but there wasn't really any other art forms that were going up the front, but only using music in church is like only painting with one color. Uh, there's, there's drama, there's, um, there's dance, there's, there's so many different art forms and different generations have their, their, uh, the things that they are good at doing. Um, they might not share the same style of, of music as another generation, but there are things that they can bring that that is really good. Um, have some painting take place in church. Have some sculpting. Get people together who um, 
where if you know there's some people in your church who really like to paint and they're different generations, get all of those people who like to paint together and just say to them, I'd like to have our church to have some paintings of this. And they can all paint a different picture that has to do with that concept. Provide materials for children to play quietly in church. Um, instead of having a separate service for kids, you could, as I've seen in some churches, um, have a have a bag that can be given to each family, and in the bag there's there are some um, there's some coloring books in the bag. There are some um, puzzles. There are some little toys in the bag, so that way the, the kids they um, they have something to do. And some parents, when they've been new to the church and they've seen that the the just the look of relief that came over them because they they don't didn't know what their kid would would be like without having something to do um include people of all ages and cultures in service where possible not everyone's going to want to go up the front um, but if you have the opportunity try to have different people from different backgrounds come up and and, and do something from time to time vary the kinds of Christian music. And if that is too much of a debate during the, the main service, then create some times and spaces where you can have alternate alternative Christian music taking place. Have it so that there's a Vesper service. Have it so that there's different times. If you, if you can't fit the different, different flavors in the main service, then find times where you can have other, other types um, showcased as well. Um, when people preach, use stories because story, that's why Jesus, Jesus used story as how to teach theology. Um, if we use stories in church, we will probably get most age groups paying attention to the sermon because in stories we can put ourselves as human beings and find our place in the story being told. And we can learn from that. Um, and here's the last idea is um, do a mission project for a group of people in your local community that are not well represented at church, look at the community around you. And if there is, if there's a group of people in the community around you that um, are not coming to your church, do a mission project for that group and see what happens. Um, it would be exciting to have that group of people also make your church home. Finally, this last one, this last one can be very touchy with um, different churches I have found. Um, there are some churches uh, who do very well at connectedness, uh, particularly in some cultures. Uh, but uh, sometimes, even though they may do really well at connectedness, um, they may really struggle with empowerment. And the thing is, when we look at the Bible, the Holy Spirit has given believers spiritual gifts. Now, these are given regardless of the age. The Holy Spirit does not wait until somebody is 30 years old or 40 years old, and then only at that point in time they give them the gift of teaching. The Holy Spirit also does not remove the gift of communications from someone when they hit 65 years old. When we look at the Bible, it, it, the, we can see that the Holy Spirit is empowering every believer in some capacity. Paul also has made it clear that everyone is part of the body of Christ. Every single person. Again, age is not a requirement of that. Um, and once again, even when you look at the writings of, of, of Paul, you see the word family come up so much. Paul refers to people as brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. Um, and once again, that is a, is a very inclusive message. And we need to... Where, where possible, I want to stress where possible, we need to give ministry opportunities and leadership opportunities to everyone, regardless of their age. And if you don't think someone is quite at the right um, stage to, to be able to lead, then ha find someone who can mentor that person so that one day they will be able to lead out. Um, don't wait for someone to stop leading and then look for someone Get that person to empower someone to be to be a, a, a Timothy um, for that person. Um, Moses had Joshua. Paul had, had Timothy. Um, 
Barnabas had Paul. We, we need to be able to um, find people in our church, even though they may not be ready to lead yet, where we can actually get alongside them, create a relationship with them, and actually slowly over time give them more and more responsibility. Um, often there's a complaint that we try to get the young people in our church to be part of our leadership team, and, and we're finding that struggle in our own church, and they don't want to be part of the leadership team. That's where we need to form relationships with them. We, we need to form mentoring relationships with them. Um, we need to get alongside them in their regular life and befriend them and slowly um, teach them the things that we know and, and encourage them. So when there is an opportunity for them to lead, they won't be overwhelmed um, and they won't also look at their calendar and see if there's something more interesting for them to do, but they will actually feel a sense of responsibility for the church and be empowered to do it. This is an area that every generation struggles with. I want to emphasize that again, it's not just um, the younger people who are not empowered. There are churches where the older people are not empowered as well. Um, application for this. Leadership teams uh, and ministry teams should look like the demographic of your church. And if you, the demographic of your church is very lopsided, then seek out people who are on the fringe and bring them into it. If someone's not ready to be a leader in your church, that's okay. But they're ready to be a minister because we are all called to be ministers. Uh, we need to take extra care also to include uh, people who are in the minority as well. Uh, I mentioned this before. When someone has the potential to be a leader, find an appropriate mentor for them. I want to stress appropriate mentor. Um, I don't know about you, but um, in my teaching career, I remember being given someone as a mentor and they were a great person, but I could not stand them as a mentor. We had very little in common. Um, we didn't agree with the way that we were. So provide mentors for people, but they need to be appropriate. They need to get along with each other. There needs to be a relationship in place before they mentor the person. Um, and finally, the responsible thing to do as leaders is that every leader should be, as soon as they take their position, every leader should be prayerfully looking for someone who can replace them one day and mentor that person. This is how legacy takes place. Um, when I have taken positions in churches, um, I, my goal as a pastor is I want to make it so that the church will be able to function without me. I want to create a space so that um, I will be missed as a person, but I, when I, if I have to leave for a few weeks on holidays, I know that the church is going to be running really well. And I want to set up the, the church culture so that when a new person does come in as pastor, that there is a strong culture um, that is an empowering culture um, so that everyone can have a say, not just the person who is in charge. Well, we've, um, there's 15 minutes to spare. It's not too bad. I was told to spare 20 minutes, but there's 15 minutes to spare where I actually have some uh, reflection questions for you. So we're actually going to do some breakout groups. Uh, I will uh, see if Emma can take over for this bit. I do have questions up on the screen, but um, Emma, do you want to, um, are things a go for everyone breaking up into groups? Um, Rachel, do you have any breakout groups there? Yep. Fantastic. Well, maybe we'll, we'll get back together in the last few minutes um, and uh, people can ask any questions. Yep. There's, there's two general questions and the other five questions, um, they may be something for you to specifically have a chat to with, with your, the leaders of your congregation. But I'll let you go for your breakout groups. Yeah, and I'll just pop those um, general questions into the group chat as well. So you should still be able to see the group chat even uh, when you're in a, a breakout room. Thank you very much, Rachel. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um,
was there any questions? If anyone did want to contact me, here's my contact details. I have had people ask me if, um, if I can assess churches for how intergenerational they are. The answer is yes, I can. Um, I do have an instrument so you could find out where you are with um, the five factors specifically. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can let me know. But are there any questions that anyone wanted to ask? And I can do my best to answer them. Just a very quick one, Joe. There's a couple of people asking whether the PowerPoints are available, whether you were happy to make those available afterwards. Uh, yes. Go up on the resource page. So yes, they, they're on the resource page. Thank you. No worries. If there aren't any um, other immediate questions, I just want to say thank you very much uh, to you, Joe, for sharing with us today and everyone else for engaging in the conversation. Definitely a lot of seeds for further conversation. Um, we've only had this one hour to, to start to, to pull apart um, some of your work, Joe. Um, it's been very, very interesting and uh, we look forward to, to engaging further. So uh, thank you very much. You're most welcome.